Welcome to the Gibson House and Property Virtual Field Trip. Before we can get started today, we are going to have to turn on our imaginations and travel through time back to 300 years ago, before there were cars on the street, before our houses and neighborhoods were built, before the train came, before gold was discovered, all the way back to when this giant oak tree was a sapling. The property is home to Yolo Arts and the Yolo County Historical Collection. Today, we will be taking a look at the exhibits and history of the Gibson House. Yolo County is home to the native Patwin people of the Yocha Dehe Winton Nation. The Patwin thrived here for thousands of years with a culture of food production, land stewardship, and an understanding of medicine. The towns and roads we inhabit today were the villages and trade routes of the Patwin's past. The Patwin used the abundant natural resources of the land and water around them to hunt wild game, fish for salmon, and gather edible plants for food, such as acorns from oak trees, like the heritage oak tree here at the Gibson House. They also used tule, willow, and other native plants and grasses to create baskets, nets, boats, and shelters. Life for the Patwin changed dramatically in the 18th and early 19th centuries with the arrival of Spanish and Euro-American explorers. Nearly 75% of their people were lost to diseases such as malaria and smallpox. The Patwin were forced to move onto a reservation of barren land created by the federal government. The large region that had been home to the Patwin was divided into smaller pieces of land for settlers to buy. The practice of land ownership caused a loss of true freedom for the native people who were used to traveling freely. They had to learn a new way of life in order to survive. Many survivors eventually joined non-native culture by working as laborers. Yolo County's population started to grow in the 1850s as more settlers made their way west to strike it rich during the gold rush. The land continued to be divided for farms, houses, and the development of towns. In the 1940s, the Yocha Dehe tribe was able to relocate to a small parcel of more fertile land in the Cape Valley, where they began cultivating crops for their people. Today, the Yocha Dehe Winton Nation has reclaimed thousands of acres in Yolo County. They have established businesses, begun food production, and invested in the restoration of the land and important culture practices. William Bias Gibson left Missouri for California in 1850. He was 19 at the time, driving a six-mule team to join his brother Thomas who had made the journey the previous year with other gold seekers. The journey took him four months. William lived and mined in several locations, including Cash Creek, Scott's Bar, and near Esparto, but he didn't have much luck gold mining. After four years, he decided it would be best to give up mining and return to his father's trade of farming. He bought 320 acres in a small wooden farmhouse in Woodland in 1857. That same year, William married Mary Isabel Cook, who had moved from Missouri in 1853. They were married two days before Christmas, and Mary moved into the small farmhouse with William. While living there, they raised three sons, Robert, Thomas, and Joseph. Their one-room farmhouse is recreated here in what eventually became their formal dining room. As you can see, everything they needed to live from sleeping to eating was here. In the corner, we see a small coal stove that would have been used by Mrs. Gibson to prepare their meals and heat water. The top burner plates lift out and she would have filled the inside with coals which burned until the stove top was nice and hot. She would then be able to cook with pots and pans on the stove, much like we do today. There would have been a bin to store the coals for easy access when needed. It was important to have it close by because in addition to cooking, this stove was used to heat the house in the winter. Next to the stove, we have a small table where they would have eaten their meals. Note, the white crockery that was used is simple and functional good for pioneer life in the farm. Of course, 
the family needed somewhere to sleep. Many pioneer families would share just one or two beds between them all. Young babies would have slept in a cradle, separate from their family. It's important to note that this house did not have running water. Water would need to be pumped from a well to use for drinking, cooking, and washing up. Basic daily grooming would be done with a pitcher and wash basin like this one. Perfect for washing your face and maybe wetting your hair after a long dusty day on the farm. Baths would be taken once a week by heating large amounts of water to fill a metal tub brought in from outside. In most pioneer families, it was common for the man of the house to bathe first, then everyone else from oldest to youngest, usually all using the same bath water. Life in the 1800s also meant a lot more domestic work for the women of the household. While one could make the journey into town to the general store to buy fabric or basic clothing, it was more common that ladies would sew and knit what their families needed. Here we have one of the first sewing machines from 1858. It was powered by a foot pedal below that would cause the needle to go up and down. This would have been a lot faster than sewing everything by hand. We also have a spinning wheel that was used to spin wool from sheep into yarn to be knitted into sweaters, hats, and socks, which were often mended or patched so they could continue to be used. Spending time together as a family was just as important as all the work they had to do. Here we have a rocking chair that Mr. Gibson could relax and read to his family at the end of a long day, or where Mrs. Gibson could sit and work on her knitting. Would you live like this? In a one-room home with your family? Why or why not? As the Gibsons' farm gained success and their family grew, they decided to remodel the house by adding a two-story brick structure consisting of two downstairs parlors and four bedrooms above. This renovation was completed in 1877, 20 years after moving onto the property. In this print from the Illustrated Atlas and History of Yolo County, we can get a glimpse of what life was like on the Gibson farm after the new structure was completed. Here you can see the ionic columns, cupola, window entablatures, and balcony. Examples of Italianite and neoclassical styles that were popular in homes during the Victorian era, which lasted from the 1830s to 1901. If we compare this to what the house looks like today, we can see that some updates have been made over the years. What do you notice that has changed about the facade of the house? Sometime between 1890 and 1906, four fluted Corinthian columns replaced the two-story veranda and the cupola was removed from the top of the home. These are just a couple examples of how the house has been updated to reflect different styles and time periods over the last 140 years. This print also allows us some insight into what went on at the Gibson farm. Horses were kept for transportation and help with farming equipment. Mr. Gibson was well known for his cattle, selling milk to the Woodland Creamery and breeding cows for sale at auction. He also farmed wheat as shown in the upper right corner. At the time, wheat was one of the top crops for Yolo County and was exported all over California. We can also see that they had stags and deer on the farm. Owning stags and deer was considered a symbol of wealth, power, and status. Victorian landowners wanted to be like the royal and wealthy of Europe, who during the Middle Ages and Renaissance kept large game preserves and deer parks. At the front of the house, on the right side, you can see even the heritage oak tree depicted. It's much smaller than it stands today, but it is a lasting legacy that connects generations of people. As we enter the house, it is important to note that during the Victorian era, people lived their lives much differently than we do now. Victorians were self-conscious, and first impressions were very important. Daily life, social status, gender, and class all had very structured roles that were present in all aspects of home life. In a Victorian household, each room was used for a specific purpose shown by the furnishing in the spaces. The Victorian experience is all about appearances, and so every object on display has meaning. The entry hall was a transitional space between the male-dominated outer world and the female inner world of the home. The hallway was also a connector to other rooms. 
The hall stand was a uniquely Victorian invention. It was mainly in use from the 1860s through 1920s. There are four functional components to each hall stand. An umbrella stand, hooks or pegs for coats and hats, a looking glass or mirror, and drawer with a marble top. The larger the hall stand, the greater the wealth and social standing of the family. Calling cards could have been left on the marble top of our hall tree. Calling cards were important in building relationships in Victorian society. Maintaining these relationships were left largely to women. At the time, there were no phones to call or text someone to arrange a get-together, so calling cards were used as a formal way of doing this. If someone wanted to visit you to get to know you better, they would leave their calling card for the lady of the house. If the guest was someone the family wanted to get to know, they might respond by sending a letter or delivering a calling card of their own with a note. The next time the guest would call or visit, they might be allowed into the entryway or parlor for a short visit, usually lasting around 10 to 15 minutes. If that visit went well, they might be invited over for a long afternoon tea. Only when the family got to know someone very well would they be invited to join them for a meal and be allowed further into the home than the formal parlor. How do you stay connected to your friends and family? Another notable feature of our entry hall is the tin ceiling. Using pressed tin panels served as a decorative function, of course, but more importantly, it was an important safety feature. These would have been used in a time before electricity, when everything in the home was lit and warmed by candles and fire was an ever-present danger. As the home and all its furnishings were made of wood, fires had the potential to be devastating. By using a tin ceiling on the first floor, a family would be allowed to slow the spread of the fire between rooms and from the spread to the second floor, buying precious time to put out the flames. Victorian era houses were divided into units. First were the large formal and ceremonial parts of the house. Second were the working spaces of the house, such as the kitchen, pantry, or laundry. These spaces differed in decoration with the front being the most important and heavily decorated, while the back of the house would have been simple and focused on function. The east parlor is the smaller of the two parlors and would have been a space used for the family to gather in at the end of their day, where only their closest friends or relatives would have been welcome. It likely would not have been used for entertaining. The furniture in this parlor is of the East Lake style, a type of architecture and furniture design started by Charles Eastlake. East Lake focused on the beauty of the wood green and included carved geometric details. The Eastlake style is different than the overly decorated Renaissance Revival style, which we can see here in the settee or couch. The settee is structured in a way that creates intimacy between those seated on it. If you considered sofas and couches of today, they tend to have straight backs to face a point of interest, usually a television, in our homes. These seats have backs that curve inward toward one another in order to encourage conversation among people. The Eastlake style came before the arts and crafts movement and the craftsman style we see shown here in the fireplace. This style emphasized simplicity over elaborate decoration and further celebrated the beauty of nature. This fireplace was added to the home in 1915 after Mrs. Gibson passed away and her son Robert and his wife Elnora moved into the home. It was among many renovations including the kitchen to modernize the home for new styles and inventions available. We also have several decorative Art Nouveau pieces, an ornamental decorative style popular for its plant-like forms and organic lines from the 1890s to the 1910s. On the mantel, we have a vase and pitcher, and across the room, on top of the parlor organ, we have a lamp in the style of American glassmaker Louis Comfort Tiffany. The parlor organ was an elaborately decorated piece of furniture. Some organs had large upper sections that included shelves, nicks, and sometimes a mirror. Pianos, larger than organs, were usually square shaped and had metal strings that were laid horizontally and struck by small soft mallets. In contrast, 
The reed organ created sound by pushing air over or along reeds by the pedal bellows pumped by the player's feet at the base of the instrument. However, the size and cost of an organ was less than a piano, and therefore fit more economically into middle or working class homes. Music was not just a way to pass the time. Getting a piano or a parlor organ was a momentous occasion because the purchase of one for the home was a status symbol for a family. During Victorian times, a family that had and could play instruments were considered to be very cultured and of good standing. During the late 19th century, one way people would remember their loved ones was to make a memento mori, or object of mourning, like this hair wreath. Locks of hair from family members, alive or deceased, were woven to create intricate floral patterns, wreaths, and even jewelry. This was used as a special way to remember loved ones, either passed on or separated by distance. Do you have any items in your home that remind you of your family members? As we move into the West Parlor, you can tell by the larger scale of the room and the decorated furnishings that this parlor was made for entertaining. The marble fireplace would be considered the utmost of luxury and serves as the central focus point for the room. Mirrors were common in the Victorian era and showed their focus on personal appearance and demonstrate a family's wealth. Mirrors made the room seem larger as well and brighter when a light source, such as a kerosene lamp, was placed in front of it. Looking up, you notice the ornate medallions around the chandelier. Upon first installation, these chandeliers would have been lit with gas lights, which burned brighter than candles and would have been easy to turn on and off by turning a key. As new methods of lighting, like electricity, were introduced, the Gibsons would have updated their home for the changing times. The furniture in this space incorporated Renaissance and Rococo revival elements, like heavily polished, dark wood shaped into medallion back chairs, and couches and rounded legs. The cresting rail, which is the decorative carving at the top of the furniture, was decorated with organic motifs like leaves, flowers, and grapes. Rich fabrics such as velvet, needlepoint, or floral woven tapestries were used as upholstery. You'll notice that the larger furniture in the space have wheels on their bases. This is typical of the time period as furnitures would have been placed along the edges of the space. When entertaining guests, this furniture could be pulled to the center of the room to allow for easier conversation. Guests visiting the Gibsons may have been treated to some afternoon tea or coffee. Coffee was everywhere in America after Spanish colonizers visited South America and brought the popular bean back to the United States. Coffee became popular among all classes of people because it gave you energy and has a rich flavor. Seen here are a coffee pot and cups. Note the tall sides of the pot and cups so that the coffee grounds could easily settle to the bottom. Wonder what the ladies of the house would have worn for entertaining? This day dress would have been worn by a Victorian woman during the late 1880s, early 1890s. Fashionable styles, like this, became more accessible as ready-made clothing, which could be purchased in newly created department stores and through mail order catalogs. Well-made clothing no longer had to be sewn at home. The bell-shaped skirt is made of a black satin and cotton blend material known as fail. Embellishments such as braid, cord, or lace trim were very popular during this period. Can you imagine yourself visiting with your friends in a space like this? What would you wear? What would you serve to eat and drink? Upon entering the kitchen, you really see how the space is different than the front parlors. The room is small and in the furthest corner of the house to keep the household work separate from the entertaining and leisure spaces of the home. This room is designed for practical use. There are storage bins built in and clearly labeled for flour, sugar, pots, pans, and kettles, and coffee. 
This would make it convenient for anyone using the kitchen to find what they needed for cooking at a glance. This is also a room where we can see how new inventions made life easier in the home. Food storage was important to be sure your family had enough to eat when a trip to the store was not possible. Rather than a pantry, like many homes have today, food being stored for long periods of time would have been kept in a root cellar, a separate structure underground that was a consistently cool temperature so food wouldn't spoil. Daily food items like milk, butter, and vegetables would be kept in an ice box. This box has an ice storage compartment on top that creates cool air that flows below to a cabinet for storing food. This was eventually replaced with an electric refrigerator that served the same function, but could hold substantially more. We saw a coal stove earlier that would have been used during the 19th century. As appliances and electricity became more widely available in the 1920s and 30s, electric stoves became popular in home kitchens. These stoves have electric coils on top and often an oven on the side. This allowed cooks to control the temperature with just the turn of a dial and eliminated the ongoing need for tending a fire and the messiness of a coal at every meal. In order to preserve food to store and eat later, canning was a common practice. Everything from vegetables and fruits to meats could be canned to remove bacteria. Canning typically involves cooking the food first on the stove, then putting it into jars with water or vinegar, and sealing the cans by boiling. The seal is important to ensure the food stays fresh. Would you like to cook in a space like this? Why or why not? Thank you so much for joining us on this virtual tour. We hope you learned a little bit more about life during the Victorian era in Yolo County. Please plan a visit to the Gibson House and property to see the exhibits in person soon and to check out other spaces on site, such as the Barn Gallery. To learn more about Yolo Arts, Gibson House, Yolo County Historical Collection, please visit www.yoloarts.org. Please be sure to follow us on Facebook and Instagram at YoloArtsCA for updates on current programs and events.